Although I've had several paranormal experiences in my life, I was always a skeptic. I try to debunk my own experiences. Like, what if I was just tired? There must be a logical explanation. However, this experience made me a believer. A few years ago, I visited my friend who lives abroad. We decided to go inside an old amusement park that had been abandoned years ago. As a kid, my friend had visited the place every week, so it was pure nostalgia for her. We snuck through a hole in the fence and entered the park. The place was taken back by nature, mostly overgrown and with small, swampy little puddles everywhere. We were nervous about snakes hiding in the grass, and about the big pack of feral dogs roaming the property. But the paranormal hadn't crossed our minds. Upon entering the park, the dogs barked at us, warning us to leave them alone, so we avoided the area where they were and went on exploring. We seemed to be the only people there. After a good 30 minutes or so, we stumbled upon an empty karaoke bar. The place felt off somehow, not like the other buildings we encountered. My friend explains that this building is not what it seems. Karaoke bars in her country are often a cover for alcohol consumption, which was illegal back then, and prostitution. She doesn't recognize the place, which is weird since she spent a big part of her childhood at the park. We figured that it must have been a bit hidden away from the crowds, since it was most likely linked to illegal activity. The moment that we entered the building, my attention was immediately drawn toward a creepy door with a broken glass panel. You could see that there was nothing on the other side, but somehow the darkness behind the door seemed more solid than the door itself. I stared at it for at least a good 15 seconds before I tell myself to stop freaking out about a door. While we explore the first floor, I hear footsteps right behind me. Thinking it was my friend, I turn around, ready to make a stupid joke about her creeping up on me. But she isn't there. I see her at the other end of the room, at least eight meters away from me. I chalk it up to weird acoustics and don't tell her about it. Do you know that feeling you get when people are staring at you? That's how the second floor felt. It was as if we had walked into a crowded room, except that no one was there. Like on the first floor, the darkness of some unlit areas somehow seemed too dark. More solid. I became increasingly nervous, but I didn't tell my friend, since I didn't want to sound crazy. Soon, my friend stopped in her tracks, and said that she wasn't comfortable exploring any further. She later described that room as a quote-unquote black hole. She recalls feeling as if all her movements were slower than normal, and as if her brain were foggy. This was right above the door that freaked me out so much. Back on the first floor, we feel silly for even being that nervous, and we try to overcome our fears. I decide to open a door adjacent to the freaky door, which was easier said than done. The door was stuck, and I had to put my weight behind it to get it to open. We caught a glimpse of a small storage room before the door was slammed shut again. We almost made a run for it, but since we stubbornly didn't want to give in to our fears and be wusses, we took a few more pictures of the room before we left. Once outside, we rationalized it by saying that it must have been some sort of animal, a stray dog maybe, but we were not convinced. Opening the door took some strength, so what animal could have closed it with such force? There was barely any space between the open door and the wall, so I doubt that it could have been a person hiding there. We talk for a bit to lighten the mood, and we feel braver now that we're outside again. We decide to visit her favorite attraction next, the pirate ship. In the past, it would swing back and forth, but now we couldn't get it to move no matter how much we tried. We both pushed against it with our full body weight, but the ship just wouldn't budge. We take a few photos while we chat about my friend's memories of the park. All of a sudden, the pirate ship begins to move. Slow at first, so slow that I thought that I had imagined it, but then it started to swing more clearly. Since we don't feel the creepy vibes that we felt at the karaoke bar, we decide to stay and watch. After a few minutes, my friend remarks that we should head back soon, since she wouldn't want to be in this place after dark. Immediately after those words left her mouth, it got darker, as if it were suddenly twilight. Remember the dogs who barked when we entered the park? 
They had been quiet since they realized that we were not a threat. But now, they go wild, barking and howling in the distance. My friend and I don't hesitate and make a run for it. We run through the dark, overgrown park while the dogs go crazy. It was surreal. Once we reach to the hole in the fence, we crawl out as fast as we can and suddenly, we feel safe again. I swear, once outside, the sun was shining bright. We looked up to see if it was just a well-timed cloud that had moved in front of the sun, but we couldn't see anything. To this day, my friend is convinced that something told us to leave, since it got dark right after we decided to go home once it was getting dark. I don't believe in these kinds of theories, but feeling-wise, it genuinely felt as if we had went through some sort of gateway when we entered that area. As if it was its own little world. The contrast was just that big. Back home, we talked about our experiences. Apparently, we both felt uneasy in the karaoke bar long before we actually voiced those feelings. I told her about the creepy vibe I got from the door and showed her a picture that I took of it when we first entered the building. She tells me she felt the same thing and took a picture just before we left. Upon comparison, we realized that the door is cracked open a little bit in my photo, but in hers, it's half open. These photos were taken five minutes apart, and it seems very unlikely that someone snuck in to open it while we were on the second floor. The dog pack was in a different area of the park, and there was no wind that day. I don't have an explanation, but given our other experiences at the park, this creeped me out even more. Like I said, I have experienced strange things in the past, but nothing like this. In the hour that we spent at that park, I went from a skeptic to a believer. I would love to go back someday and see what happens. This happened to me when I was a teenager. I think it was in the spring of 1998 when I was 14. My Boy Scout troop went camping in the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. I grew up in a very small town in Tennessee and the boys in my troop were people that I'd known my whole life and we were all very close and knew each other very well and trusted one another. We had been hiking for five days or so and it was miserable. It rained every day, and we were all exhausted and sore and hungry and covered with blisters. The adults realized that we had bitten off more than we could chew in trying to hike a 60-mile trail, especially with the awful weather, so we had changed course and gotten off the trail to spend the night in a drive-in campground. It was the kind of place with hookups for RVs, picnic tables, it had fire pits and grills, and a central bathhouse with showers and toilets. It was in a very remote area, far from a town or another house. There may have been a few other small groups, but if there were, we never interacted with or saw any of them. We were all filthy and wet and thus very excited about taking a hot shower. It was dark and we had finished dinner. A group of five of my friends, including my friend Jeremy, who, like everyone else in our group I had known since we were babies, headed up to the bathhouse, which was maybe a quarter mile walk through the pitch dark woods up a worn down gravel walking trail. I stayed behind to clean up, and after 10 or 15 minutes, followed them by myself. I had a weak little flashlight, the old incandescent kind, pre-LED. When I got about halfway to the bathhouse, I could see the light from it off in the distance through the woods. I heard a noise to my left, and I looked over and saw my friend Jeremy standing by an old-school manual water pump about 20 feet away off the trail. There was a strange light around him, like the moon had come out from behind the clouds. I was startled to see him there by himself in the woods. I asked him if he was already done with his shower. He seemed kind of sad, and he said, Yeah, it's all yours. I said okay and didn't think much of it until I got to the bathhouse. When I walked in the door, my friends were all in there and I heard Jeremy talking from in the shower. All the blood drained out of my head and all the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I had to sit down before I passed out. My friends were really freaked and wanted to know what was wrong. 
I told them what had happened. They nervously made jokes about how I must have been smoking pot. But this was long before any of us had ever experimented with any mind-altering substance. Regardless, I could tell that they believed me. Like I said, we had known each other forever, and knew when one of us was exaggerating or playing a joke. We all waited together until everyone was finished showering and brushing teeth, and then walked back together in complete silence. When we got to the spot that I had seen, whoever he was was gone without a trace. The water pump was still there, though. No one had noticed it before, because it was a ways off the trail and obviously not in use. We got back to our campsite and went to bed really scared. I remember not sleeping much that night. In all the years since then, I've never been able to figure out what occurred. Was there a random teenage boy in the woods who looked just like my friend? Unlikely. Did I hallucinate it? Also unlikely. So who's to say? This is the story of the time I saw an apparition that looked as if it crept right off the silver screen. This encounter happened in the late summer, early fall of 2007. I was in the fourth grade and my family had just moved to the absolute boonies of Mississippi. I was born in Mississippi and still had a lot of family down there, but my father had been stationed in another state for the previous several years. Military. So I guess you could say we were moving back home. My parents were in the market to buy a house, but until they found one, we would be staying with my great aunt and her family. My aunt had a beautiful but slightly run-down 100-and-something-year-old home in the woods on the outskirts of an abominably small town. In order to get to her home, you had to drive down a one-lane dirt road through the woods. On this particular afternoon, my sisters and my cousin, who was about our age, were playing tag in the front yard of my aunt's home. Now, you need to know a little bit about the layout of this yard. The yard was longer than it was wide. Picture a rectangle with the house on one end and the dirt roadway at the other end of it. If you're looking at the house from the road, the right side of the yard is bordered by muddy soil, thick trees, and bamboo that creates a sort of natural border to the property. On the other side of the yard is a length of tropical leafy bushes about waist high that run from the front of the porch almost down to the road separating the yard from the driveway, just on the other side of the plants. Near the road in the middle of the yard was a ginormous old oak tree dripping with Spanish moss. Now back to the game. This particular round of tag, I was it. My siblings and cousin were running around the yard in the house, trying to hide behind various things. As I was scanning the yard, I noticed the figure of a girl with long, straight brown hair peeping her head out from behind the big oak tree. She was wearing a dress that fell below her knees, which was very different from what the rest of us kids were wearing, namely cut-off jean shorts and stained t-shirts. I thought it was odd to see someone there, since I could have sworn that I saw all of the girls run in the opposite direction toward the house, but I figured I would go and check it out anyway. As I made it to the tree, I looked behind the trunk, and there was no one there. I was beyond confused at this point. My ten-year-old brain didn't immediately jump to ghost. It was more along the lines of, who the heck was that? The tree was in the center of the yard, with no other trees or shrubbery within twenty or so yards. So if the girl would have run up from behind the tree, I should have seen her. By that point, I started scanning the yard, and my eyes happened to fall to those tropical bushes that bordered the driveway. Crouching down near the bushes was the same figure of the girl. I remember her squatting near the leaves and peering in my direction when I noticed that she had no face. She was completely absent of any facial features, eyes, lips, and nose. Her face was just a smooth expanse of flesh-colored skin. It looked like something straight out of Silent Hill. I must have looked away, and then she was gone. I have never seen this apparition 
sense. Now, I honest to goodness recall this encounter just as I have described above, but it was also 14 years ago. It's quite possible that my memory has faltered in some aspects or as exaggerated in others, but this is how I recall it. Either way, it was terrifying. When I was 14, I went camping in the summer with the girl guides. We only traveled a few miles away to a place that we had visited a few times for game nights. Each year, our guides would merge with the two others in the area for a huge campout that lasted about five days. The place we were staying in was rumored to have a ghost in the main house. The story says that it only shows itself to members of the family. We were staying on the large estate near the woods, right away from the house. I had been there quite a lot, and knew the grounds pretty well, which was awesome. I was staying in a tent with the younger girls, they were aged 10 to 13, because I didn't have my own tent like the other older girls. The first night went by smoothly. We built a climbing frame, lit candles in the dark, and pretended that we had landed on an alien planet. It was a silly fun game. The next morning, me and one of the other girls get up early. Our group job was to collect firewood for breakfast, so we ventured into the woods on our own. We were joking around, grabbing sticks and stuff as we walked along. We ended up at the obstacle course and decided to play on it for a while, even though it was out of bounds. When we were done, we grabbed the firewood and started walking back to camp. The woods, to me, they felt and looked strange. It was as if the place was slightly different. I decided to start trying to scare the girl that I was with, just messing around, trying to spook her because it was funny to me. She got really scared and ran off and left me behind. I wasn't bothered as I slowly walked back. That was when I saw movement to my left, and then again up ahead. As I was about to leave the woods, I saw a man out of the corner of my eye. He was wearing a white t-shirt and a cap, carrying something long. I think it was a shotgun. There was no one there. I just shrug it off. Stuff like that doesn't bother me. I've seen strangers out in the woods before. Once out of the forest, everything goes back to normal. I looked back and the woods were as they should have been. Not like they were moments ago. I don't know how to explain it. They just seemed newer for a while. Not as wild, I guess, but everything was kind of grainy, misty, except that there was no mist. So I don't think anything of it. I enjoy the camp out, we play games, sing songs, and just have a good time. On the second to last day, we play the game. We landed on the alien planet, and once we had breakfast, we had to go hide in the woods, build a shelter, a fire to make food, and people had to go steal food from the campsite without being seen. I am left in the woods on my own for ages as the other girls go around gathering the food. I built a pretty awesome shelter, but I realized I needed my pen knife, which I had left in my tent, so I went to go get it. I get to the tent to find the kids that I was sharing it with, crying their eyes out, terrified. Eventually, I get the story out of them. They had been making their food when a man, wearing a white t-shirt and a cap, had appeared and then vanished in front of them where I had seen him. I assured the kids that it was fine, and that it couldn't hurt them, and they eventually went back into the woods, but they were obviously very shaken. I got the blame for telling them a scary story, but I had only tried to scare that one girl at the very start and hadn't mentioned anything about the man to anyone. That night was the campfire. As it ended, we all ran through the pitch black woods back to camp, leaving the person looking after us all alone in the forest. She had a light, so it was no big deal. She had to make sure that the fire was out as well. I found out a week after that that she had been horrified walking back to camp and refused to go back into the woods again after that. She has refused to camp at that site ever since, but she won't tell us what she saw. The last day, I got bored while packing everything up. 
After all that had happened, I was in a ghost hunting mood, so me and two of the other girls go into the trees. I'm in the lead, and I'm walking along a path. I stopped and heard footsteps in front of us. Clear footsteps, walking on dead leaves, but no one was there. No one was anywhere near us. I followed the sounds along a path. Someone had heavy boots on. It was so bizarre. We all had trainers on. The girls I was with were silent. They could hear it as well. I followed the sounds around to a clearing at the very edge of the woods where it stopped. I decided to sit down in the grass. The others followed me, but they sat behind me because they were scared at this point. I do the whole, if anyone is there, could you give me a sign? Routine. As I finished, a white mist suddenly fell over the woods. You could see things moving behind it, though nothing was clear. It hung in the air as the other two girls ran off, screaming. I sat for a minute and watched before saying thank you. As I said this, it was as if a gust of wind hit, and it disappeared. There was no wind. It was just amazing. That was the last of the strange stuff for that camping trip. We had to finish packing up and left the camp that afternoon. I've been back a few times since, and nothing else strange has happened. The woods have always felt normal. A few years after that, I found out that I'm actually related to the family who owned the house and estate. I'm always curious if the activity picked up because I was staying on the grounds. When I was 17, a senior in high school class of 1997, I stayed with a family in West Ireland as part of my church's program abroad. I lived there for six months. The family's home was a cottage-style home, very old, but comfortable and loving. Those were my thoughts, as we pulled up to the front anyway. After I had spent a little time there, I began to feel something heavier. Something silent, yet consuming. At first I kept telling myself, new places, new faces, it's all just new, and that's why you feel this way. Regardless of what I told myself, though, it was impossible to stop the feeling that I had in my gut. The feeling didn't only stay there, either. It grew. I had nightmares nearly every night. Before I had never so much as remembered my dreams, much less suffered from night terrors. I would wake up with the covers thrown off of my body, off of my bed entirely. Sometimes, I swear, I would wake up just as it was happening, and when I did, there was almost always a cold chill in the air, even in the summer months. There was a boy there, the owner's son, Eric, who I asked whether anyone had ever complained about the draft that would seemingly come from nowhere in that room, the room where I stayed. He told me that there was probably something wrong with the window. He didn't look comfortable talking about it at all. In fact, Eric tried to avoid eye contact and interactions with me in general throughout the duration of my stay. He really wanted to avoid my inquiries. Back to the nightmares. They almost always involved me trying to find the source of this icy cold breeze, with me walking aimlessly around this one room, my room. The chill would almost start to burn my skin. You aren't supposed to be able to feel pain in your dreams, right? Well, I did. So were these actually nightmares or something else? I still don't know. Eventually, the nightmares got to the point where I could hardly move inside the dream. I would be bound to my bed, stuck looking around the room. 
By this time, it wasn't just the nightmares or the blankets that scared me. It was waking up in pain that left me feeling out of control, terrified. I would have visible marks, not scratches, but rather patches of irritated skin. Small rashes that burned. My stomach would ache a horrible pain as though it were eating itself. Again I approached Eric, the son who slept just two rooms down from mine. I asked, or told him rather, there is something seriously wrong with that room. I then showed him my rash and began to explain the nightmares. He was visibly uncomfortable and then started calling for his mother, Nancy. I liked Nancy. She wasn't as strict as my mother, who was ten years older than Nancy, deeply religious, and highly skeptical about pretty much everything. I respected my mother, don't get me wrong, but I didn't exactly feel like she listened to me when I spoke about many of, well, too much anything, really. And as much as I liked Nancy, I just wasn't sure how she would respond to me asking me about everything. I was quite nervous. Nancy spoke with genuine conviction. She talked as though she had lived a thousand lives, but she also felt incredibly open, if that resonates with anyone. She filled me in on all the local history as we walked through the town and the church. Over the last few months, we spoke of the Great Freeze and the famine that the area had suffered many years ago. She talked about the rebuild. She taught me a lot of things about Irish history and culture, and I found it very interesting that she was a member of their historical society. I had asked Nancy about ghosts before, just general questions, really. Like, had she ever seen one? Would I possibly see one? She laughed and told me to consider myself lucky if I had seen one on my trip. That she had not seen one in years. I sort of took this to mean my question was silly, that there was no such thing as ghosts in Ireland or something to that effect. Turns out, I was wrong. Eric tells Nancy, Corinne says there's something wrong with her room. She even got proof. He shifts his gaze to me and nods, saying, show her your arms. My sleeves up, I shift my arms around into Nancy's view. She doesn't look surprised by the markings. I see. She gave a long pause as she examined me before asking, How have you been sleeping? Not great. I've been having nightmares for months, but now it's like I can't move. That's what I was just telling Eric. The two of them look at each other. For some reason, this spirit likes to communicate with the girls. I suppose it was because she was a young girl herself. We believe that her name is Emma. Nancy explains that the house has been in her family since the early 1900s, but prior to that, it was owned by the same family for many decades, and one other just before that. The house had survived the famine. The family didn't. It was typical for families to huddle in the highest room of the house, or for the last surviving members to stay in that type of room, typically children. They didn't always survive. There were several deaths during that time. I was convinced that the area itself was inherently haunted by that point. Why do you think her name is Emma? Have you spoken with her? I asked Nancy. My sister did, Eric piped up. That was her old room. Nancy cut in. Yes, she used a Ouija board, which she didn't have permission to do, by the way. And she says the girl's name is Emma. She died here, in this house, in that room. She died hungry and freezing. Your rashes are probably the early stages of frostbite, Eric said, adding more eeriness to the vibe. There was a bit of silence after his statement. I was feeling better, actually. Not about what he said, just in knowing that I had experienced something that someone else had as well. Did your daughter get these rashes? 
They both confirmed that yes, she did. Well, how did she get it to stop? She moved out, they said in unison. Attempting to break the slight tension that had begun to build, Nancy tells me, You're welcome to sleep on the sofa. Might not be very comfortable given the state of your arms, but it might suit you better. At that point, I had just one month left out of my six-month stint. I opted to sleep on the couch, but left my things in the room. Every time I entered the room, I would say hello and goodbye to Emma. Once I started sleeping on the couch, my dreams returned to normal. I actually mentioned to them that they should offer the couch first to any future guests, as the improvement was so drastic. They explained to me that they didn't get many guests anymore. Apparently, word had gotten around that their guest room was occupied, if you will. My mom must have missed that memo. They weren't even willing to entertain that what I had experienced was real. Not that I was expecting much. They were by no means an open-minded pair. I ended by saying that when I left for good, I tried to give a pep talk of sorts to Emma. I think she was struggling either to move on, be heard, maybe both. The next time I paid them a visit was on the 10-year anniversary of when I had been living there, 2017. On that visit, I got to meet the sister. She, Eric, and I walked through the old guest room, which had been converted into a sort of sewing room. The sister looked at me and asked if I could feel a difference. I stood there a minute, and closing my eyes, allowing myself to relax, I didn't feel anything except for sunshine coming through the window and tickling my face. I looked over at her and said, it's lighter. And that made both of us smile. My unit in the U.S. Army was deployed to Iraq in April of 2006. We were in Ramadi. It was 123 kilometers or 77 miles outside of Baghdad. I was in a Humvee headed to Baghdad for emergency leave due to a death in my family. It was close to midnight and the Humvee I was in was with three others and a turret gunner. The two other Humvees had the same five total people, one in front, one in back. I was without a weapon due to my leave. The Humvee in front stopped hard. We all figured it was a possible IED or VBIED. The team leader in our HV radioed to the lead HV. The convo went along these lines. What's up, why did you stop? Something flew in front of the HV. What? Flew in front of the HV? Yes. We didn't see anything. And then the third HV piped in, does anyone hear that helo? HV-1 replied, yes. HV-2, our HV, yes, but I don't see it. Just then, in the desert, off the highway, was a black figure. It looked like a huge bird. It was like smoke was emitting from it, like a blackish, greenish smoke with a bit of blue tinge. We all focused our eyes to the two troops with better night vision. They could see something but couldn't make out what it was as the smoke was distorting the view. Within a second or two, a rock was thrown at one of the HVs. A big rock, like the size of someone's head. We all froze. Because of rules of engagement, we weren't allowed to just light it up. We used a spotlight, and in that light, something just flew straight up, and it was loud. And then we heard a loud screeching noise as well. Within a minute or two, it was over. We all sat there in a state of shock, curiosity, and panic. WTF was that. When we got to Baghdad, the translator that they were picking up to bring to the Marines that were with us said that it sounded like an ifrit. The team leader said, what? He explained to us that it was a winged jinn. We were all a bit speechless. We chose not to disclose to our command the winged thing as battle fatigue, now known as PTSD, was a career killer at this juncture. 
It's been 13 years since this happened and I met my now husband in 2015 and he had also been deployed to Ramadi with my sister unit at the time and he had went through this particular stretch of highway on his mid-deployment leave. He recounted a similar story to me. It was enough to stop me in my tracks. It was pretty close to mine except that they didn't stop, they just boogied on through. Considering the time we were there was very deadly, including an aid station manned by soldiers that was ambushed and blown to bits. I was a medic, so death was my norm. I still can't wrap my mind around it. And now, apparently, the last two places I lived in, something has followed us. This story took place in the mid-2000s in Malaysia, when the Nokia 3310 was still a thing and teenage idiocracy was the ruling personality. I was only 14 at the time, and while introverted, I had a group of friends who were mostly in their late teens and early 20s. While this may seem unusual, it is somewhat common for Malaysian teens to have friends with considerable age gaps. One day, this group of friends decided to visit some abandoned flats and condos from a failed development project. The reason? They wanted to try their hand at ghost hunting. Not wanting to be called a coward, I naturally took up on their little excursion. It was planned that we would visit these supposedly haunted buildings on a Thursday night. The night rolls around and there we were, 20 people including myself arriving at the abandoned flat. The flat, darkened by grime with windows missing, presumably detached by junkies to be sold for some small change, loomed over them. Group by group, we entered, flashlights drawn. As I recalled, it was around 10 p.m. Slowly, we made our way up the floors, exploring each unit, calling out to whatever might be residing there. The men's group had splintered into their respective groups, their hushed conversations, callings, and the occasional bouts of snickering and laughter echoing throughout the apartments. I stayed close to my group, not taking the chance of losing sight of them for even a second. For about two hours we were exploring, calling out to whatever ghosts or spirits we believed were making this flat their home, but we received no reply. At this point we were tired, bored, but most importantly, hungry. After a couple of calls between the heads of each group, it was decided that we would end the night and go have something to eat. So off we went, a small convoy of cars to the nearest restaurant. As we arrived and settled in again in our own little groups, we ordered our drinks and food and started shooting the breeze. The topic about the abandoned flat was initially on the table, but was quickly dismissed since we never found anything interesting or experienced anything ghost-related at the location. That is, until one of the restaurant servers marched up to our table. His face was stern, and he was pointing at the younger kid who was sitting quietly minding his own business, and he asked, Who are you? No reply. Again he asked in a louder, more demanding tone. At this sudden outburst of questioning, we were all stunned and had our focus to this server and that kid who was still keeping quiet with his expression blank. The server turned to all of us and asked, Where were you just now? Where did you drive from? A guy from my table told him that we had just left that location. The server looked at us and still with his eyes on us pointed to the kid he was questioning and asked all of us, Do any of you recognize this kid? Nineteen pairs of eyes shifted toward the quiet kid, and it hit all of us at once. None of us knew him. We made a head count and totaled twenty heads, including this kid. My group leader asked the kid's group leader if he recognized him, but he said no. But you drove him here, right? You were with him, right? They were asking. Yeah, he said, but I don't know this kid. At that, the server turned to the ashen-faced group leader and told him that his friend was still at the flat. He said, you go return this thing and you find your friend. Only you and your group. The others cannot come unless you want someone else to be switched. We shifted in our seats, and after what felt like an eternity, the guys at that kid's table got up, went to their car, with the kid following them without asking or invitation. 
even after food and drinks arrived for the remaining men. Any appetite that we had before had dissipated. The rest of the story was told to me by my friend who heard it from the group leader with the quiet kid. When they returned to the flats, they swept through each floor, every unit, and every room looking for the missing kid. The thing that switched places with the kid? The entire group dare not look its way as it tailed behind them while they searched. They felt its presence as they climbed the floors, sensing it growing more and more incensed as they neared the top. It took them about an hour before they found who they were looking for, passed out in a room on one of the upper levels. When they found him, they felt the malicious anger of the presence vanish, and then they mustered the courage to look over their shoulder. The kid was gone. They didn't hesitate in getting themselves out, not even bothering to fully awake the passed out kid and ask about his condition. One of the bigger guys grabbed him and they all ran, each of them praying to whatever they believe in to protect themselves from whatever resided in that abandoned flat. They got to the car, practically throwing the kid they found in the back seat, and after the engine sputtered to life, the driver buried his foot into the gas pedal and they sped away. As I recall all of this, I remembered a conversation that I had with one of my Malay friends who is a little serious on matters of the occult. His stance when it comes to them? We don't disturb them, they don't disturb us. So don't go snooping around in their territories. I have been fascinated by ghosts and the supernatural my entire life. I've had a few experiences here and there, but this one in particular was the most significant and frightening. First, some background. My dad's side of the family is Native American, and some have a deep suspicion of owls. They're considered evil omens. Anyways, my grandmother was very, very attuned to spirits. She had the so-called second sight. She had a whole wealth of stories about her encounters with the paranormal, who she passed on to my aunt. But anywho, this next bit is relevant. A few months before she passed away from lupus, she woke up in a panic and came running into my aunt's room. My grandmother was generally a stoic, unflappable woman, so this was not like her. She dragged my aunt into her bedroom, asking if she heard it. My aunt heard nothing. What my grandmother had heard was the so-called death owl. She passed on not too long after that. Fast forward about 10 years or so, I'm up around 4 a.m. watching TV. As I recall, it was around December of 2008. I heard this noise outside. It sounded like a woman weeping. The best way I can describe it was a voice that was caught between an owl's cry and a human's. It was very unnatural. I got a cold feeling in my gut because I knew. I knew exactly what it was, and it scared the ever-loving crap out of me. I remember being paralyzed with fear. I grew up out in the country, and I know what an owl sounds like. I've also heard bobcats, foxes, and the dying screams of rabbits. This? This was none of those things. Others have tried to claim that it was just an animal, but it was like no other animal I've ever heard. That, that unearthly wailing noise. Like it was in mourning. It was the kind of sound that freezes the blood in your veins. At the time, I thought it might be foretelling my father's imminent death, since if you hear it, it either means that you or a family member is going to die. Or... It predicts great disaster. And for clarification at the time, my dad was having some significant heart trouble. But he's much better now. Now comes the twist. On April 9th, 2009, a huge wildfire swept through my area. A lot of houses burned down, 
and mine was among them. When we came back, my home was nothing but a pile of smoking rubble. It took me a bit to make the connection, but I am positive that the Death Owl, or Banshee, was an omen that predicted this disaster. One thing's for sure, I hope to God that I never hear that thing again, because I will never forget it. I have a suspicion that this thing stalks my family. I can't be certain. I'll have to do some research into my family tree. I know this might sound unbelievable to some, but I swear till the day that I die that this is all 100% true. So there you have it, folks. My most significant paranormal encounter. This took place a few years ago. I was with my best friend and we decided to go camping at a campsite in Flagstaff named Locket Meadow. We had taken our dogs. After a day of hiking and exploration, we played around a fire and eventually went to sleep. I awoke in the middle of the night to find this deep figure outside of our tent burying itself into our tent. It had a weird way of hovering back and forth over my body, and my dog, who was curled up awake and not moving or making a sound, was at the bottom of my feet. I look over and see my best friend passed out, and his dog, which I'm unsure if it was awake, but clearly I was the only one between my friend and I that's experiencing this terrifying encounter. I eventually covered my head and thought about anything else that might make me fall asleep. The next day, I asked my friend if he had somehow been awake through all of that. I explained what had happened. He replied no, and thought that I was just making it up. I told him maybe it was a bear, so we looked around our campsite, but couldn't find anything. No trails, no prints, nothing. We also had food out on a table near our tents, and a trash bag hung up on a broken branch. So even if it was a bear, I'm really surprised that it didn't get into any of our stuff. Either way, I remember how scared shitless I was seeing this dark object observing our tent. Could it somehow have been the wind? A deer? Who knows? But this is just one encounter out of the whole trip. The next night, we decide to camp at Beaver Creek. Mind you, we're in Arizona. Before we wanted to settle in, we explored Sedona. We drove to Oak Creek and parked our car near a trail down by the water. We took our dogs and hiked to the creek. After we finished jumping in and swimming, we dried off and were about to head out. Next thing you know, in our peripheral vision, we see a giant rock being thrown near us. It makes a huge splash in the water. We look up and don't see anything above, so we ran over stones and rocks to get a clear view of the top and still see no one. We yell out taunts and curse words, but still heard no one running off or any kind of sound in response. When we got to our next campsite at Beaver Creek and set up, my friend told me that throughout the trip since we started in Flagstaff, he had rocks being thrown at him, right up until that giant one at Oak Creek. We looked at each other and thought that maybe someone was following behind us, messing with us. Then we sort of laughed it off and said no, that was impossible, that we were just trying to connect the dots to have it be a cool look-back adventure. Well, I'm glad that it didn't turn into a part three, because nothing happened that night, or the next day, where we packed up and headed home with nothing more than a memory that we wanted to rationalize. Before my best friends and I were separated, one passed away, the other moved away. We used to ride around doing all of the haunted legend places within reasonable driving distances. Sometimes we would drive for a few hours, but most of them weren't scary other than the adrenaline-filled, hyped up, did you hear or see that? That would cause us to get spooked. 
This one was different. Way different. We were just out of high school, probably 20 at the most, and we were looking for an actually scary place to visit. A lot of people we knew knew that we were into these kinds of things, so we would always get tips on where to go. There was the original three of us that day and another friend that wanted to tag along. After a little drive to our destination, about 45 minutes, we stopped at a Wawa to get gas and grab a few snacks. Like I stated earlier, we were all about 20 at the time, so we were all hyped up because we knew that spooky time was getting close. We'd always pick on that other friend that tagged along. Nothing harsh, but just, ah, you're scared. So I believe it was me that said something along those lines that was overheard by a few people. It got the attention of other people in the Wawa, including these two creepy, older guys who seemed like they didn't fit in. Their clothes were all beat up and dirty and they just didn't seem right for the area, and the time was probably 8 p.m. on a Saturday night. What's the little one scared of? asked one of them. I say little because the three of us are all abnormally tall. The shortest between us was 6'4", and he was normal, so probably about 5'9". We replied and explained how we got tipped to go to this road, because it's haunted. They replied that it wasn't scary, and if we wanted a real scare, we should go to this random road. I forget what it was called exactly, but apparently it's this random memorial statue for a plane crash in the middle of the woods, where crazy things are supposed to happen. We grabbed our stuff, didn't think anything of it. As soon as we left, the group started talking and decided to go with the other road that the guys had hyped up. I know, a typical horror movie what not to do. So we get to the entrance of the road, and already it did not disappoint. There were woods on both sides, not one street light in sight. And I remember there was this, like, detention center off to the right, in the middle of nowhere. So the spooks already began from the moment that we hit the entrance. We decided to drive down the road and search for the statue. We noticed that there were trees cut down on the side of the road and laying parallel to the shoulder of it. We finally find the statue. About five minutes go by in silence, and we decided to enhance the scare factor by shutting the lights off. About a minute goes by and we see a shadow figure pop up from the statue. We all freak out as it starts walking toward us, but it was making movements that no human would normally be capable of. It was dark out, but this thing was black. It was darker than the woodsy sky, so we could make out some of it. It was huge. Like I said earlier, we were all extremely large compared to the average guy, but this thing would have dwarfed any of us. We decided to peel out of there and continue down the road figuring that it would lead us out. Boy, were we wrong. About three minutes go by, and we hit a dead end, which in this case was an open spot in the woods with sand everywhere. The cutout was massive, but surrounded by forest. There were different cutouts and ways to go from there, and I'm pretty sure the road continued after this cutout, but we were pretty deep in the woods by that point. So we decided to turn around and leave, obviously. After we turn around, we stopped to just take in the eerie feeling. The other three guys were talking about the shadow figure that we saw earlier while I happened to catch something out of the corner of my eye. About 40 feet away from me, I see what appears to be a white face, and then another, and another, all surrounding the car. The other guys didn't see them, and I'm rarely ever scared, but seeing me panic, they all knew that something was up. My panic caused them to panic. We then floored it far away from the sand turnaround. We get about half a mile down the road somewhat near the statue, and pull over to gather our composure before we get out of there. When we stopped, I swear I heard the most typical ghosty, ooh, kind of noise. This was now turning into a movie I wish that I was never part of. 
We were really scared. After finding the way that we had come, we started heading back out. Remember those trees I talked about earlier? They were now laying in the middle of the road, blocking us in, as we all see the white faces or masks that I had seen earlier. Thank God my one friend, the driver, was good at driving and valued safety over his car. We drove on the edge of the woods and felt like we were defying gravity to speed our way out. The car was literally sideways on the edge of the forest. I mean, I could literally stick a single finger out the window and touch the trees. We all made it home safely that night. After doing research, we found out that that spot was notorious in that area for crazy things happening, such as body dumps and murders. Because of the shadow and the ghost noise that we heard, my head, heart, and gut tells me that that place is actually haunted. As previously stated, that place is famous for dumping bodies, along with the plane crash, so there's bound to be some spirits there. I think where we were that night was actually haunted, but we just happened to be there on a night when there were more things going on. I can't say for certain, but I'm 99% sure that we survived one of their setups that night. I'm 100% sure that I will never go back again. My girlfriend and I often get bored with our hometown, so we travel our state a lot exploring abandoned places. Some of these places are also deemed to be haunted. I'm browsing on my computer one day, and I find this prison located about three hours away from us. We decide to drive out there on the upcoming 4th of July because we figured that no one would be there for the holiday. This prison was very large, with ten or so buildings ranging from cell blocks to indoor workout areas. All of these buildings were surrounded by guard towers and fencing that was impossible to enter without breaking the chain links. We parked behind these trees in the front parking lot and walked up to the main building entrance used for prisoner intake. Lucky for us, the front door was simply opened and we could have just walked right in. We passed through that building and here we are now inside the prison itself. It's a very large open space with sidewalks and courtyards connecting the buildings. However, there were little things that seemed off about the whole place. Dead crows that lined the sidewalks were the most noticeable. It was like they flew over the prison and just fell out of the sky. Even the graffiti was made up of weird symbols that we didn't understand. We passed all that a little on edge now, and as we walked, I saw letters on the buildings. A, B, C were regular cell blocks. When we passed B, I thought to myself that we should check it out because B is the first letter of my name. Odd thought to have, but I went with it. The cell blocks formed the shape of a T, and in the middle of the T was a guard station with a ladder leading them to the second floor if they needed to go up there without having to interact with the inmates. This upstairs area connected to a hallway that led to a boiler room and a door with stairs leading down the side of the building. I walked up those stairs and passed the boiler room, but I stopped dead in my tracks when I got to this hallway. I shined my phone flashlight into the hallway, and even though it was daytime outside, my light only went one inch into this area. I felt myself shiver even though I live in the south, and it's 90 degrees outside. I ask out loud if anyone is here with us to make yourself known. I'm sure this was a mistake, but I didn't mean it negatively. I just felt compelled to say it. From this pitch black darkness, I hear a noise that sounded like something scurrying away, such as a small animal. I figure that's all it was. I figure that's all it was that made me nervous when all of a sudden I hear footsteps full on sprinting directly at me. It sounded like whatever it was had massive feet and could run unnaturally fast. I ran out of the building and down the stairs with my girlfriend right in front of me. We both looked at each other and determined that whatever it was did not want us here. We ended up walking around just a little bit more to other parts of the property, but we felt watched the entire time. 
As we departed through the front door, we felt better, almost as if we were being released from an unpleasant fog of energy. We had sage in the car and burned some, which also helped us feel better. I try not to think about it often, but I do wonder what we encountered. There has always been folklore around black crows and their cawing that my mother has always believed in. I've always been in love with anything creepy, so I bought into black crows aesthetically, but never actually believed that they served as an omen for death, as they're commonly known for. That was until I was told this story later in my life. My mother is from Central America and was born and raised there, only moving to the United States around 2000. She's always been superstitious. She would tell me when I was a kid to be careful around crows. Try not to let one fly in my path or disturb one because they symbolize death and can predict it if someone in your life is about to die. I was just a kid, so, again, I never really believed any of that and just promised to follow these rules to please her. It was still hot and sunny out when I was beginning elementary school and my mother and father were at home painting our back deck as we had just moved into a new house. This was the first house that we lived in since my mother moved from Central America to the States. All of my mother's family were thousands of miles away from her. She was always worried that something would happen to someone in her family while she was gone. My father was on all fours painting the deck, and my mother had come outside to give him a drink when a black crow swooped down right over my father's head. My mother immediately began to panic and cry. Before my father had a chance to ask her what was wrong, the home phone rang. My mother picked up the phone, crying, and burst into Spanish, asking, Is it Dad? And what happened? Before she even knew who was on the other side of the call. It was my mother's family, calling to tell her that her father had indeed just passed away. I came home that evening, and my father explained that my grandfather had passed on, but he didn't tell me of the crow story. When I was a little older, my mother had told me the story, and my father confirmed the order of the events. That story is so strange to me, and ever since then, I, too, have been wary of crows and their presence in my life. My mother said that she just knew her father had died in that moment. When the phone rang, she knew she was getting THE phone call. I find it interesting that the crow flew so low over my father, perhaps directly symbolizing that a father figure in someone's life had passed away. Where I live, around that time of year, a crow should have been nowhere in sight. There had not been any around that day, or for months even. All of it is just a little too bizarre and creeps me out to this day. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail that I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot and head off the trail to find a place to set up my tent. I stumble upon this nice size clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point, but set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line and manage to get a fire going. I roast some weenies and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer with a lame leg, as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, kind of dragging noise. 
I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that and go about eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and insert myself into my sleeping bag. I decide that even in my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep, so I pull out a book that I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear the sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk slash drag across the clearing toward my tent. It was really loud at this point, and now it sounds as if the hooves are being really heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after, like the deer is dragging something along behind it. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops, and I hear nothing. No breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness. What on earth? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for other noises. There was just crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods, and I tried to not let it bother me. Besides, I did have my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, followed by women's laughter and sticks snapping off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing or just a product of being half asleep. Then I hear more faint laughing from a couple other different directions, all sounding like different people, and confirm that this is real. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire off a warning shot into the air in case they come too close. Something about this laughter, how far in the woods that I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line, seeing nothing. I listened intently to my surroundings. There was no more laughing and the forest sounds had returned. I relaxed just a bit and figuring that I had scared whoever off, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering, not very far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle again and listen to what they were saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost, so I shout, Hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I call out again, Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly, a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people that were just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise, back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the entire way. I never heard anyone follow me. I never saw anyone or anything the entire time, but couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me. I left all my gear in the woods that night. On Labor Day of 2015, my mother, my wife, three children, and I went to a very remote cabin that we had rented out. It was an old fire watchman station or something of the sort, so it had the cabin and three other sheds and shops. I'll try to keep it short now, but this is a really bizarre story. 
We unpacked, settled into the cabin, and decided to take a walk a couple of hundred yards down to the river. We were all barefoot wearing sandals with shorts. We got down to the pebbled shore and were playing, throwing rocks, etc., when I realized that there were one-foot snakes everywhere. My wife, mom, and I yanked up the three kids and boogied off. After reaching a safe distance, I went back with a water bottle and caught one of them to see what it was. It turns out we were in a nest of diamondback rattlesnakes. If one of those things had latched onto one of my kids, then surely they would have died. We were about three hours away from any medical facility. We got back to the cabin and my mom and I went for a hike alone while my wife calmed the kiddos and fed them lunch. Upon returning about 15 minutes later, all three of my wife and kids were inside with the doors and windows all closed, even though we had opened everything up to cool the place off. We went inside to hear all four of them start yelling about a bear that was about 150 yards from the cabin huffing and puffing at the wife and kids on the front porch while they were eating. It was down by the river, another 30 yards or so down the hill. A few hours go by, and in that time, an ATV passed three times with two inbred-looking freaks on it, and each time they stopped in front of the gate onto the property and stared at us or the cabin. Keep in mind, again, we're hours into the wilderness in Idaho with no sight of a person the entire trip except for them. We decide it's bedtime for the kiddos, as it's pitch black out. Within 10 minutes, our son, who was five at the time, went from being perfectly fine, active, and talkative to having a fever of 103 degrees, slightly foaming at the mouth, and being completely unresponsive. That was it. We were leaving immediately and going to seek medical attention. I opened the front door of the cabin to start loading the two cars, and that's when we heard three adults and what sounded like four or six large, heavy animals running all around the cabin and property. There was one on the right side of the house when exiting that I could hear pacing back and forth, breathing heavily. I made everyone stay inside and close the door every time I went out to transfer stuff into the vehicles, which took me about four to five trips. I had a stick in a big pot that I was smacking as hard and loud as I could each time and was yelling loudly at random. As soon as I finished the loading, I took out each kid individually and loaded them into the cars. Then I escorted out my mom and then my wife. My wife and I were in the lead car, so we pulled up out of the gate and for some stupid reason or other, I felt that I needed to close it. I got out of my vehicle and walked behind it and my mom's car by about 15 feet and closed the gate. Now this gate is literally a log that slides from one post to the other. It offered zero protection or barrier between me and the animals that sounded like they were out there. Right as I went to turn around, I heard loud padded footsteps walking up to me. Directly in front of me, no more than ten feet, I see eyes shimmering from the moonlight as the deepest, scariest growl I have ever heard in my life rumbles through the air. I turned and ran so fast I swear that I must have jumped from where I was to the driver's seat of my car some 30 feet in front of me. As I landed in my seat, I slammed it into drive and spun out, finally leaving. It gets weirder and scarier, though. About 15 minutes down the road, we were still panicking about our unresponsive son. We both kept having this horrible, evil doom kind of feeling, like a shadow over us. I looked down and realized that I still had that baby rattlesnake in the water bottle in my cup holder. So I grabbed it and threw it out the window immediately. Not even two minutes later, we softly hear our son begin to cry. We realize that he's become responsive and he stated something along the lines of, Why are we leaving? What's going on? He was crying because he was sad to leave. He couldn't even remember the last hour. The next day, my mom broke down extremely badly, sobbing her eyes out, and was hardly able to even speak. She confessed to my wife that the night before we left, she had a nightmare in which we went on the camping trip. We came across snakes, a bear, and a pack of wolves. 
She said that she knew a lot of bad things happened at that outpost, and that it was full of evil. Most of all, she said that one of our kids died. I swear on my life to this very day, if I ask her who died and how it happened, she immediately starts crying and refuses to tell me, or anyone else, anything more. She lives her life now with a guilt that she willingly ignored her premonition and put us in that situation nearly taking the life of one of her dearest grandkids away. She doesn't deserve to feel like that. I know this all sounds insane, but a week later on the local news were reports of a wolf pack in that area. Wolves and bears may not coexist in harmony, but they do share territories and tend to respect each other. This outpost station of sorts was one and a half hours into the wilderness from Loman Banks, Idaho, if you want to verify that these animals actually exist around there. I grew up in the mountains for most of my pre-early teen years, as did my wife until she was ten years old. I even have a half a sleeve of the wilderness and trees on my left arm. With that said, we don't care to go to the mountains anymore. I was reading somebody's Reddit post today where they talked about their mother being scared because she heard three knocks and related it to the three knock omen, which I had never heard of. I decided to do some research on it, and apparently there's a superstition around hearing three knocks because it's supposedly followed by a death in the family or someone that's close to you. That has happened to me. A couple years ago, I went to a mountain resort in California for a little over a month and stayed with my sister and brother-in-law who lived there. Around the same time when I came, they got a new roommate. He was a nice guy, maybe in his late 20s, early 30s, an ex-alcoholic, but overall, just a really great guy. I spent a lot of my summer going on hikes and playing video games with him and my brother-in-law, and I would say that I got to know him pretty well, but not as well as my sister and her husband did. The roommate, Jack, had lost a close friend a year or so before when he got drunk and decided to fall asleep outside in the middle of a snowstorm, which apparently happens more often than you would think. Since then, Jack had never so much as touched a beer, and he was quite proud of it. Anyways, it was around my third or fourth week there, when my sister and I were watching The Baba Duke, and it was pretty late at night, around 1, maybe 2 a.m. The movie ended, and she was going to let me sleep in the room with her since Jack and her husband were out camping or something, but I don't really remember what they were doing. It was silent in the house, and all the lights were off when we heard three loud, distinct knocking sounds. I asked her if she had heard them, and she said yes, but it was probably just the dryer making noises upstairs. It was a fairly new dryer that didn't make any sound. Maybe around ten minutes later, we heard the same three knocks again, but my sister rode it off to the dryer being noisy once more. It didn't sound like a broken dryer, since it was three obvious knocks, though. I don't want to go too far into the history of the house or anything, but it was definitely haunted. Things would randomly fly off of shelves, and the lights would randomly turn themselves off. Also, some of the furniture that the house came with had what we thought were blood stains. I wrote that night off to the spirit in their house messing with us since we were watching a scary movie, up until today, when I put everything together. Two days after I left, they found Jack dead in his room, upstairs. They said he drank himself to death, which was surprising considering how proud he was of getting sober. Maybe the death knocks were real, or maybe not. Maybe it was all just a coincidence. What do you think? Also, I should probably also mention that he had a bad liver from his previous drinking problem. I don't really know how that works, but I guess one night of extremely heavy drinking did it for him. 
I didn't push for more information about his death since it really shook my sister up. All she said was that he drank himself to death. Disclaimer. In no way am I saying that death knocks are 100% real or that if you hear them, a family member or friend will definitely drop dead. As for the furniture that we thought had blood on it, it might not have been blood. Maybe it was just an odd colored stain from where something had been spilled. I'm not saying that I'm sure that Jack's death was related to anything that happened in the house. I just made the connection and found it fascinating. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with this job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things that I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time, there was something else that I couldn't quite place. It lingered for a few moments, then went out just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself that it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was indeed about to find a body. Holding onto a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location, and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it was when I had first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light in there. It was just an empty tunnel stretching the width of the highway. Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the bush behind me and the smell engulfed me and was even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized that the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away further into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was alright. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking and walked briskly back to my car as they drove away. Then I got the heck away from there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. 
I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought that I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he simply responded with a concerned yes. A little background on this guy. He is the son of a missionary and has been around the world. He has seen, rather smelled this before, and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. There's always the chance of a very scientific explanation, and I hope that one is out there. This is the only time I have ever had a threatening contact or experience. In June of 2019, me and a friend had decided to go with our girlfriends on a camping trip. It's the day of, and we're packing all of our things into the car. We finally get everything loaded and get into the car and put the address in the GPS. We set off, and after three hours of driving and 45 minutes of hearing my friend and his girl argue, we finally arrive. We get out of the car, and me and my friend begin to unload. After getting my stuff, I begin to gather my girlfriend's things. As I was, my friend was asking his girlfriend why she needed three bags for a one-night camping trip. She smiled and opened one of them, which contained an ounce of pot and other paraphernalia. The other two bags had her favorite snacks and clothes. Now knowing that we had weed, we had to find a place to camp that wasn't near any other people. It took until sundown, but we discovered the perfect spot. We decided that after we got everything taken care of, we would eat hot dogs and smoke. We started to build a campfire to light the area so that we could set up our tents, but ran out of wood immediately. I said that I would go get some while my friends stayed with the girls. I set off on my journey, and after about two minutes, I find some sticks to use. I start picking them up, and all of a sudden, I felt someone grab my wrist. I looked up to see a very pale, strange-looking man wearing a blank expression. For a man, he also had surprisingly long fingernails. He was digging them into my wrist while trying to grab my other wrist. I turned my head to not see his face and screamed for help, and my friends shouted a response, saying that they were coming. After they shouted, I immediately felt relief in my wrist. I wasn't struggling to keep my arms down, so I turned. I turned and ran as fast as I could, horrified. I met up with my friends and said that we had to leave immediately. I didn't even bother to explain myself. I just wanted gone. We loaded back up and took the long walk back. We get to the car and load our bags into it. I explained what happened as we were walking back and it scared them enough to make them want to hustle. I had a picture of my wrist right after, but my iPhone broke and my cloud wasn't backed up, so I lost it. I do have a picture of it now, though. It has since then become a scar, which shows just how much force he was using. It was absolutely terrifying. I do believe in the paranormal. Not routinely and not as an explanation for everything, but I definitely believe that some things just can't be logically explained. I've dabbled in divination for the past couple years, which has led me to notice more universal symbolism and omens. Recently, I've seen some weird ones. I was driving around my area the other day and passed a funeral procession twice. It struck me as sort of unsettling and out of the ordinary. I drive around a lot, and I don't usually see funeral processions around just randomly. I was a little bit anxious by it, especially so when I passed the hearse itself. 
but I pretty much brushed it off. That same day, I was pulling into a drive through at around 3 a.m., and a black cat came out of seemingly nowhere. It strolled in front of the car and continued walking into nothing. It felt very rare to see, since I live in a well-populated suburb that doesn't usually have animals roaming about. This morning, there was a black cat watching my window on the windowsill of the house across from mine. As I looked at the cat, it began to thunderstorm. I know it all sounds really small and maybe a touch overzealous, but I couldn't help but feeling odd about these things because of how out of the ordinary that they felt, and silently spooky. Not to mention, all happening in the same couple of days. The closeness of it all made me curious, and I had to look into it, just to see if these things were things that other people believed to be bad omens. In my very unofficial research, I have found that, one, passing a funeral can be bad luck and can, quote-unquote, hasten your own death. Two, in European folklore, a black cat crossing your path can be unlucky and lead to misfortune and death. Occasionally, however, they can represent good luck, but from what I've found, it's fairly situational. And three, in Greek mythology, thunder could represent punishment to the humans by the gods, associated with Zeus. Clearly, death is kind of a theme here. All of this just doesn't sit well with me, and it's accompanied by a generally strange feeling that I've noticed prevailing in my mood lately. Something just feels off, you know? I was born a twin, but my twin sister died at birth. So did all six children my parents had after me. Those died pretty early into the pregnancy, so it was mostly miscarriages. My twin was the only one who took a few breaths before passing. I'm the only one who survived and grew up to be the adult I am today. I only lived in one house during my entire lifetime, until recently when I got to finally move out. There's good reason for that. I learned about my siblings, especially my twin sister, when I was 14 years old. But when I was a first grader, I would wholeheartedly believe that I wasn't an only child, and tell my teachers and the other children about my sister who I was playing with and sharing a room with. By the way, I don't have actual memories of this, because no one was there. But I didn't lie for attention. I genuinely believed that. I had a fair share of trauma and mental illnesses in my life already, so when I started to hallucinate disfigured shadows and children in my house at age 12, I went to see a therapist, and it was deemed a symptom of my PTSD. The shadows would form a kind of uncanny young girl's shape most of the time. Until recently, I just discovered these hallucinations were side effects of my admittedly fragile mental state, since the encounters really scared me. Sometimes it even felt like it would talk to me in a weird, unfriendly way. They stopped at the age of 14, when my mother finally told me about my siblings but still on the staircase to my room and around the dinner table where those things appeared, I would feel watched or even chased, especially at night. Sometimes when I'm awake late, I hear footsteps up the stairs to my room, but they just stop in front of the last step and don't go back down, but seem to start from the bottom again a few minutes later. This changed when I got together with my boyfriend, he started sleeping over and spending more time at the house, naturally, and I never told him about my scary encounters. So when we were still up at night and the footsteps occurred, which I had learned to ignore quite well, he looked up from his phone screen, clearly alerted, and my stomach dropped. He's a skeptic, so after he mentioned how the sounds were weird, he quickly got his mind off of it. A few weeks later, my boyfriend went to the bathroom at night. In the morning, he told me how weird he felt walking up the stairs. 
He felt like someone was watching or chasing him. I never told him about how I always felt this exact thing when I walk up those stairs. Those occurrences with him started piling up until I got genuinely terrified of staying longer than necessary in that godforsaken house. Right after I turned 18 earlier this year, I started working my hardest to afford to move out. And I finally did it last week. So far, I haven't had scary encounters in my new home. Something is telling me that it was her the whole time. Since I was a child, she's been tormenting me. The way my skeptic boyfriend experienced it, the same exact way without knowing, convinced me. I am not crazy. I believe in the paranormal, but I'm skeptical about most of the stories that people tell. It's extremely hard to distinguish between a fabricated story and a true story when you can't see facial expressions or hear changes in a person's voice. About a week ago, I was sitting in my kitchen browsing the web, probably Reddit, on my phone. My kids had been asleep for about an hour and my wife was in our room finishing up a paper for work. There wasn't a radio or television on. While browsing in complete silence, I heard my wife cough several times. The cough sounded as if she had breathed in some water and was trying to get it out of her lungs. Jokingly, I jumped out of my chair and ran over to the room where she was sitting. I started patting her back and pulling her earlobes down, again in a joking manner. She looked at me like, what the hell? So I told her I was trying to help since she had coughed so hard. She, still with the what the hell face, looked at me and said that she hadn't coughed. I stood there and evaluated what I may have heard. I thought it might have been one of my kids, but the cough was from a woman. It wasn't a four-year-old or one-year-old girl's cough. Other things about this cough is that it came from inside the house. It was the type of hack like after water goes down the wrong pipe. It was one succession of coughs, about four of them together. How did the coughing not continue if the coughs were heard that hard at the beginning? It didn't and still does not make sense. But that's not the only thing that happened. Fast forward to the next morning. My kids are awake and eating in the kitchen. I'm in the living room watching TV, still waking and drinking coffee, and my wife is in our room getting ready for the day. All electronics are off except the TV and our phones. My wife's phone rings from what sounds like the kitchen area. She runs to the kitchen to answer it because she was expecting an important phone call from work. She searches for her phone in the kitchen, but does not find it. She asks if it was my phone that rang, but I told her no. My phone was in my pocket. Turns out, both my wife's work phone and personal phone are in our room on the other side of the house. We checked the kitchen and surrounding rooms for anything that could have made the ring, but we found nothing. I don't know the name of the ringtone, but it's a very common ringtone for iPhones. My wife and I searched for the reasoning of why we clearly heard a phone ring in the kitchen, but no matter how hard we tried, we were unable to find a logical explanation. I was going to write it off as just another weird coincidence, but I kept thinking of how clear the phone ringing was, and how my wife had heard it too. Add this one to the cough that I heard the night before, and I start to worry that there may be an intruder in my attic. I think, nah, not possible. But I have two little girls and a little boy too. It's a slim chance, but I'd feel better if I just went up there and checked. I texted my wife to watch the kids because I was worried that there might be an intruder. I didn't want to verbalize it because if they were up there, then they would hear me. I check outside and around the house first for any signs of a person being on the roof or anything like that. I look for cuts in the wall and see no signs of intrusion whatsoever. I then grab the ladder to get inside the attic. The only way into this attic is through a small, 2 by 4 foot opening at the top of the interior of a closet in one of the rooms. I grab my flashlight and my gun, set the ladder up, and plan on entering the attic as quickly and tactfully as possible. I don't want the intruder to be lying in wait. 
I push the drywall that blocks the opening and can hear a door swing and shut. I say swing because it sounded like a door that was on a hinge or hinges. I can't get the drywall off, and the element of surprise is now gone. I push through anyway and inspect the attic. The attic has no floorboards. You have to navigate through it by standing on the supporting beams. It's extremely annoying to have to go up there to do housework. I find no signs of anyone being up there, no entry points, and again, no cuts in any of the walls. I come down and double check that my wife and kids had stayed in the living room like I had asked in case there was an intruder. She confirms that they were, and that no door had been shut. I pretty much already knew that the door shutting wasn't them because the sound came from the attic, but there's no door in the attic. I went through a checklist of explanations to the cough, the phone ring, and the door shutting, and again, have yet to encounter a single one that makes sense. I know it sounds weird, but a freaking portal is what I'm coming up with. I lived in this house for years, and have always heard weird noises, but never something like this. Most portal stories I've heard sound totally far-fetched. Usually a portal story includes a demon or something spiritual, but this was just totally random. People crossing dimensions to hang out in my attic? There's no malice, no sightings, no physical evidence, but the sounds were definitely heard and are inexplicable. Something else happened a few nights ago. It was around 11 p.m. I'm asleep in bed and am woken up to my wife shaking me. She tells me that she heard a door close. I say to her that it may be our four-year-old, but she says she was watching the monitor and the cameras were on the kids. She said that she had been watching the monitor because she had been hearing weird noises. I say maybe it's just the house creaking. She claims that she heard the windows shake. Now this is significant to me because we do have some old windows. The difference between the old and new windows is that the old windows will rattle when a door is shut due to air pressure or when the house is shaking, earthquakes, and the new windows won't. So she heard a door close and the windows shake. That's enough for me to grab my gun and check for an intruder yet again. I do an interior and exterior check and of course find nothing. I go back to bed and once again conclude that there is a portal in my house. When I was 16 years old, I'm female by the way, my friends and I decided that it would be fun to go out to an old abandoned farmhouse that was rumored to be haunted. We didn't really believe in ghosts at the time, but were fascinated by the thrill of potentially experiencing something paranormal. So on a hot summer night in July, we decided to take two cars out to this abandoned place. There were six of us in total. It took about 45 minutes to drive there, so we left around 2.15 a.m. because we wanted to arrive at the farmhouse by 3 a.m. Witching hour. To get to the house, we drove down a dark, winding country road with houses few and far between. There were no street lights, so although it was a warm summer night, it felt incredibly scary as we drove through the unfamiliar place in the pitch black. As we arrived at the house, I nearly felt sick to my stomach. I didn't believe in ghosts or the paranormal at the time, like I said, but something in my gut just felt wrong. The house was situated at the bottom of two hills, and there was no driveway in front of it, so we had to park at the top of the hill where there was an area off to the side of the road covered with crushed rock. We got there just in time to fulfill our plan of arriving at Witching Hour. As we walked down the hill, we saw the house. It basically looked exactly how you would picture an old abandoned farmhouse. Exposed gray wood, pieces of siding falling off, and old overgrown plants all around the entrance. There were two levels to the house. The first level had two windows on either side of the door and the top had three windows. One to the left above the door and to the right. As we walked closer, we saw that the door was open, so we dared each other to go inside. We formed a line to enter. Two of my friends, who were guys, went in in front of me, and I was the third in line to enter the house. The first guy is friend number one, the second is friend number two. 
As we enter, I immediately felt ice cold. I have never felt that kind of cold in my life, as in, I felt it all the way in my bones. As soon as I felt it, I heard friend number one scream at the top of his lungs. It all happened so fast that I could barely make out what it looked like inside. I mostly remember an uninviting couch laid across the stairs with the living room to the left of the stairs and the kitchen to the right. It was like walking back in time, old floral wallpaper peeling off the walls. So the second that friend number one screams, we all run out of the house immediately. As I look back toward the entrance, I notice that only friend number two exited the house behind me and friend number one was still screaming inside, like blood-curdling, in fear, scream. Friend number two runs back into the house and grabs friend number one and pulls him out. My first friend was so scared that he ran from the house screaming that something was holding him up by the air by his shirt. He rips off his shirt while he's running, and all I see are three big tears in the back of it. It looked as if three prongs from a pitchfork had ripped through the fabric. But it doesn't end there. As my second friend stepped foot outside the door, he begins yelling in pain. I looked back, and he had blood dripping all over his face. I literally felt like I was in a horror film. He came toward me, and I was in full instinct mode. I took my sweater off and gave it to him to try and stop the bleeding. He just yelled at me that something had hit him in the nose and that he needed to get to the hospital. So we run back up the hill, which felt like a thousand years, to the car. When we get into the car, I get friend number two tissues and clean up his nose and I shine my light on it to see what was bleeding. His right nostril had a clean cut all the way through it, as if someone had taken scissors or shears and cut it. And it gets worse. As we're driving away, my friend and I both look to the house and there's a candle lit in the top left window. Then, as I look to the other side of the road, I still want to cry when I think about this. I have the image and feeling just burned into me. And there's this old trailer with a light on and the silhouette of a man with a hat on in the window. I am 100% convinced that this old man was an evil spirit. Just the feeling I got of him staring at me, watching me as I drove by. I still feel the chills when I think about it. I felt like it was a warning to never come back to his property. Like he was the spirit that hurt both of my friends and that he was sending me a message. On the drive back, we ended up bringing my friend to the nearest ER, where they stopped the bleeding and stitched up his nose. He still has a scar from it, and his right nostril looks as if it were dog-eared from where it split apart through the stitches when it healed. I was at Fort Sill for basic training. Every night we took turns doing the fire guard. It's basically where two soldiers rotate every hour to watch the door and make sure that everyone stays in bed. There were four barracks bays. Ours, the female bay, was upstairs and across the hall from a male bay, but we used separate stairwells. So us females and drill sergeants were the only ones using this center stairwell. The drill sergeants would come up to check on us periodically. The doors were heavy and loud. We could clearly hear when they went into the bay across the hall. Every now and then, we would hear footsteps come all the way up the stairs and stop. Neither of the doors would be open, and we'd never hear them go back down. We even heard objects rolling down the stairs. You could hear them hitting every individual step as they went down. It was so scary. After lights out, everyone had to stay in bed. We had to let the fire guard know if we were going to be getting up to go to the bathroom and no showering was allowed after that time. There were times that we would hear people talking in the bathroom in the middle of the night and sometimes we would hear the showers going. We would go to look because we would all get in trouble if someone was up making noise, but no one was ever in there. I should also mention that the lights are motion sensed. So we would walk in and the lights would turn on meaning that a physical person hadn't been walking around in there for at least a few minutes. 
Our beds were all in rows and lined up. One night we all got woken up by a scream right next to our row of beds. All of us sat up at the same time, freaked out, and looked at each other. We couldn't figure out where it came from. This was in 2019 at Fort Pickett during our annual summer training. We were in the field, which is basically like camping in tents. There was a large open field where the medical tent was, and then our personal tents were back in the tree line. There were a few nights where people were woken up by something shaking their tents, whispering their names, or vivid nightmares. Some even saw figures standing outside their tents. Some people had dreams that they were woken up only to be in another dream. I was with another sergeant in a two-person tent far off to the edge of the group. One night, I heard footsteps all around our tent, almost circling it. It was as if a whole platoon was walking past us very slowly. But our medical area was so far away from all of the other training areas, and as far as I knew, no one was out training at 2 a.m., period. This last one happened at Fort Indian Town Gap. My ex used to tell me while he was sleeping that he saw a man or figure standing next to the bed or in the corners of the room. He often saw a man with a mustache, specifically. I don't know who that could have been, but anyway, fast forward to another annual training and we had some free time one day, so most of us decided to go back and take a nap in the barracks. The girl in the bunk next to me was asleep for about an hour when she woke up and asked me if she had been screaming. I said, no, you didn't say anything the whole time, you were just asleep. She said that she had just had sleep paralysis and thought that she was awake. In her awake dream, she was in the same barracks with all of us, but we were all staring at her. But the thing that got me, she said that there was a man with a mustache standing next to my bunk. He was bent over and was the only person looking at me instead of her. She's a complete skeptic and I had never told her about what my ex saw. This is a completely true story. There was one time about two or three years ago, I was out in the woods camping with my brother, and we had just gotten there around 4 p.m. to set up and all. Once we had settled in, we got a fire going. I told my brother I was gonna go get some firewood, because we only had enough to get it started. So I went out, and it was around 7 p.m. Then I got really cold all of a sudden, even though the weather was not cold at all. When I got the sudden rush of coldness, I felt a heavy feeling of just pure evil hatred, and despair. I immediately went back to my brother. He told me it was fine, that it was probably just a strong wind that had given me a chill. But I knew that something was wrong. We sat around the fire, and I just felt like someone or something was watching me. Once again, I started to feel the same feeling of evil, but this time faintly. It slowly started getting worse and worse almost as if it were growing inside of me. I brushed it off and went back to bed. At around 2.20ish in the morning, I heard something that sounded like a scream, and it woke me up. I looked around in the tent and got a flashlight. When I turned the light on, I noticed that my arm was bleeding and had been cut open by something in multiple spots. I woke my brother in a panic and told him what had happened, he said he didn't know what I was talking about, and my arm wasn't even cut, even though I was looking right at it and it was obviously slashed open and bleeding. I said, are you joking? And he continued to say that nothing had happened to me and that I was just pranking him. At that moment, I felt a huge amount of pain in my arm, and then I heard the scream again, but it didn't sound like how a human would scream. It was more of a screech, as if there were an animal or some creature in the distance that was in pain. I looked at my brother and asked if he had heard it, and he asked me, what do you mean did I hear that? There was nothing. At that point, I was afraid for my life. I was praying that nothing else would happen, but after a few minutes, I heard the scream again. Every time I heard it, I would feel that dread 
that evil again, and my arm would start to have a burning sensation. Eventually, all of it stopped. Although after that, I wasn't able to sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, I told my brother that I wanted to leave ASAP. When we went to get into the truck, I could have sworn out of the corner of my eye that I saw something run through the woods. I looked to the right while packing the stuff up, and four of the trees had marks like they had been clawed by something. But the thing is that the marks were at least 12 feet up in the trees, maybe higher. I was so tired and scared that I couldn't even think about it anymore. I just got into the truck and we left. To this day, I still haven't gone camping again. I would like to preface by saying that I am a Roman Catholic who has experienced paranormal phenomena since I was five. My late grandmother had experienced similar phenomena, and my mother and sisters also, but to a much lesser degree. As I get older, I notice the experiences are slightly more darker in nature. I know very little of demonology other than what has been referenced in the Bible. I try to stay away from anything referencing demons, the devil, etc., which is why this experience was so difficult and I was not prepared. In October of 2018, I was admitted to the hospital due to an electrolyte imbalance. I was in a room with three other female patients. On my second night, my arms were finally free of the IV, so I was able to move around and assist the other women, who weren't as mobile, in getting ready for bed. One of the women was much older and cranky. She seemed to take an instant dislike to me when I first moved into the room, but warmed up to me after I helped her. When the lights went out, I decided to lay on my stomach and say my silent prayers. To the casual observer, it would have looked as if I was asleep. During this time, I could hear the woman that I helped argue with herself about me. She stated that I was nice, and then she replied to herself stating that I am not what I seem or something to that effect, and it went back and forth like that during my prayers. Shortly after, the room started getting really cold really fast. I silently prayed to God to watch over her and free her from any negative influences. It was then that I heard her say these words very loudly. I don't know the Lord's Prayer and my name. I freaked out, quickly processing what had just happened. The woman knew that I was praying over her, and there was no way that she could have known that. In my mind, I instinctively knew that I was not up for the confrontation. I was weak and still recovering. I got up from my bed, and with my back to her, I said something like, There is no way I can stay here now. To which she answered, Yes, go. I won. And laughed really hard. I was amazed that the other two women had slept through it. It was around 10 p.m. when this occurred. The room was stiflingly cold at this point, and I ran to reception and asked to be discharged, but the charge nurse said that I couldn't leave without my doctor discharging me. I begged again to be discharged, but was denied, and the nurses tried to call me as they got a hold of my doctor, who said that he would be in at 7 a.m. and that I needed to stay put. I asked to be relocated to another room in the interim, but the only available room was directly next door, and that was way too close for my liking, so they put me in the day room with a blanket and pillow. I used my phone to call my sister to get me out of the hospital. She works at another hospital, and told me the car wasn't home and to catch an Uber to her place. The ward was locked down for the evening though, so I couldn't leave anyway, and chose to just stay in the day room. The TV was on standby, but I could hear voices coming from it, even though the screen was blank. The voices talked about a shooting at the hospital I was in, with thousands of fatalities. It then talked about my baby nephew being in a plane that was shot down. By then, I was truly hysterical, as fear for my family took root and everything I learned went out the window. Throughout this time, the voices from the TV continued calling me names, etc. I couldn't stay any longer in the day room, and the nurses had me on a stretcher right in front of the main desk, where the charge nurse could see me. It felt like a really bad dream, and I was hysterical and paranoid. I laid down on the stretcher, and that's when I noticed hanging overhead the ward number, 
66. I was also on the sixth floor of the hospital. I wondered if that was why there was so much activity there. Not long after, I started hearing other voices coming from different rooms of the ward asking about me. They seemed to be communicating to each other and laughing. I started silently praying again with more conviction. A male patient in the ward nearest my stretcher started crying out for help, claiming that I was hurting him. I prayed even harder, citing the Lord's Prayer. He asked the nurse for the name of the lady outside hurting him, and she gave him my first name. He started crying again, joined by another voice two doors down. I prayed to know who they were in Jesus' name, and all these voices talked at once, but the one name that I could clearly make out was Beelzebub. I continued to pray throughout the first night as they taunted, laughed, cackled, and cried. At this point, the light in the man's hospital room was turned on as a nurse was with him trying to calm him down. I had been sitting up on my stretcher bed whilst praying and watched his silhouette as he tried to inch his way to the open doorway. It was then that I noticed the odd shadow that he cast. It was so strange. It looked like a spiky-headed being with a dog. Spiky-headed in an almost cartoonish way like Bart Simpson. It continued until morning and I was moved to a small private room awaiting the doctor. The voices were still verbally attacking and threatening me, but my hysteria was long gone by that point and I was just determined to leave. I ended up discharging myself before the doctor arrived, but had to return as I still had the IV catheter in my arm. On my return, they placed me in another ward. I refused to go back to Ward 66, and I was allowed to recover in peace. And eventually, the mnemonic taunting stopped. I had a course of bad luck following that event. Basically, all of 2019 was a series of misfortunes and bad luck that still hasn't come right. I don't know what to do other than just keep moving on. I went to a psychiatrist last December who said that other than the trauma I would need their help with, I was in good mental health. This is a story my grandma and grandpa told me a while back. I'm originally from a small town in Pennsylvania, and my grandfather was a state trooper for a majority of the time that he lived there before retirement. He took a course on hazardous waste removal. I can't remember his reasoning, but he was trained to be a guy in a hazmat suit who took toxic or irradiated waste away from certain locations. One night, while he and my nana were asleep, he violently jolted straight up to a sitting position in his bed, still asleep. He pointed to a chair in the corner of his room and said to my grams, who had been awoken by his movement, Mary Lou, he's sitting right there in the chair. Do you see him? My nana was freaked out, so she tried to get him to lay back down in the bed, which took a few minutes, but eventually he was back to sleeping soundly. In the morning, my pop said that he saw death sitting in the chair in his room staring at him, and he took that as an omen that he was going to die very soon. About two months later, an incident at Three Mile Island occurred, and the police force out there asked my pop's station to send all of his people there who had hazardous waste training to help get it cleaned up. My pop decided to take two weeks off and take a trip to Mexico with my mom and uncle because of the dream that he had had. And when he got back, many of the people that he had known at his office had some kind of radiation poisoning that eventually killed them. I don't tell it as well as they do, but I thought it was an interesting story. A couple of years ago, me and some friends had a short-lived phase of trying to go and explore as many cool, abandoned places as we could. One of these was a very old hospital that had been closed for roughly 20 to 30 years, I believe. It was pretty central, in a big town, so it was quite regularly maintained as far as terms of boarding up windows, doors, etc. to keep people out. Our first visit started with us climbing through a window near the middle of the building. 
We pried a plyboard board up from the window, but as soon as me and three other friends got in that room and opened the door into the main hallway, we agreed pretty quickly that we shouldn't be there and left. Unusual for us, as we quite clearly weren't scared of much if we were easily able to break and enter into a building in the middle of town. We'd also never been scared and anxious of anywhere before, and it's weird that all of us agreed that we should leave straight away. Our second visit is where it got properly weird. We went back about two weeks later, and all of the plyboard on the windows was replaced with metal sheets. Which isn't strange for a building in a large town where people break in regularly, apart from the fact that the window that we went through originally was completely open. We climbed through anyway, and got all the same feelings again, except when we tried to open the door into the hallway. It was locked, and felt as if something was pushed up against the other side of it. We went back through the window, and I was last. As I was about halfway out of the window, I heard a young girl's laugh pretty much directly behind me in this small room, and I nearly fell out of the window trying to get away from it. I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me at first, until one of my friends asked if I had heard that laugh, and that's why I jumped through this window. All my other friends had heard it too, and said it sounded like it had come from inside the room. All of this is pretty normal stuff, and I'm sure that the door being locked or having something behind it was just someone moving stuff around inside if them and their friends were exploring too. The young girl's laugh that we all heard from the room we were in, and how we felt on both visits, is what we can't explain. This story took place during my childhood, when I was about 12 years old. A few days ago I thought about it, and still don't know exactly what it was, and what I should think. It's not the most spectacular story, but anyway. I grew up in an apartment that was pretty outside the city and close to a forest. We had a lot of greenery around, and we were always playing and sometimes also camping outside with friends during the summer. So one night, me and two friends decided to build my tent and sleep outside. We were always then staying up really long and telling ghost stories. While we did this, we suddenly heard noises from outside the tent. We were all holding our breath. Then we could hear steps. They came closer and closer, and then the steps even went around our tent before stopping. We got really scared and said, Whoever you are, go away or we will call the police. It seemed to work because the steps continued and headed away from our tent. After a minute or so, we then tried to be brave and go outside the tent to see who it might have been. Then, when we looked out, we saw a woman, dressed in a long white gown, walking away in the dark. I still don't know who or what she was, but it continues to give me chills. This story comes from my girlfriend, who told me that a couple of months ago her mom was exiting an office that she works at in the middle of the night when she saw an apparition. She described it as looking like a very abnormally large black dog that was staring her down in the parking lot. Apparently the dog charged at her and vanished as it went through her, never to be seen again after that. Now, my girlfriend's mom is no stranger to the paranormal and has tons of crazy stories, and this being the latest incident, she knew it meant something bad. She called my girlfriend frantically, asking her to check on her grandpa, who they were taking care of for about a year at that point, but he was okay. Two days later, however, he passed on. This also happened to my girlfriend's grandma on her mom's side, where she was outside and saw a large, black dog on the roof of her house staring her down until it jumped down and vanished into her as well. 
Her first husband died after she received this visit from the dog. From what I could take from the story, it seemed more immediate than just two days. It was the first I've ever heard of a large black dog figure appearing, and a few hours later, my curiosity led me to searching for similar experiences online. I stumbled across mythology and folklore, speaking of how large black dogs and or hellhounds are omens of death. This paranormal encounter took place at the hotel I worked at last year. I was 20 years old, working at a small mom-and-pop hotel in Ontario, California. I had worked there for some time before I started to stay there for a few months. The owner taught me everything that I needed to know so that I can run his business while he went on a business trip to Africa. Mind you, I didn't have a car, so my only option was to stay there and work around the clock if need be. I didn't have to pay for the room, and I got to wash my clothes in the laundry room. There was a grocery store in walking distance, and restaurants all around me where I could get food at a discounted price since I worked at the hotel. I thought this was a sweet deal. One night, my boyfriend came down to visit, and while he was in the bathroom, I heard banging coming from the room next to ours. Then, I heard scratching on my walls. I told him to stop playing, and he didn't even know what I was talking about. The banging continued all night, so I called the front desk and told them that the people next to me were loud and that I had to be up at 6 to go down there to work. She was quiet for a moment, and then she told me that she hadn't rented out the room next to mine. Mind you, I had an end room. I quickly ran outside to see if the curtains were open or closed, and they were open. I could see right into that room, and no one was there. I had never been so creeped out in all my life. I decided to sage the room to get rid of any bad spirits or energy, and that worked for a while until it didn't. The next time, something demonic happened. I was asleep and kept hearing whispers in my sleep. I hate whispers with a passion, and they creep me out to the fullest. So I sat up in bed, and I was looking around the dark room, and in the corner of the room, I saw white, glowing eyes staring at me. I felt frozen by its glare. I could see its body and saw that it was crouched down, holding its knees. Then I saw more shadows appearing closer and closer. I went to turn on the lamp next to the bed, and it didn't cut on. So my next thought was that I needed to run outside and get to safety. It took all the balls in the world for me to get up and do that. I was so scared that I couldn't even feel my legs. All I could feel was the cold wooden floor beneath me. I got to the door and flung it open, only to see that the bedroom curtains were on the outside of my room's window. The sky was black, and the clouds were a dark green with gray tint. I was mortified to realize that I was still asleep, and that I hadn't actually woken up. I looked back inside the hotel room and saw myself asleep in the bed. I screamed bloody murder, and that's when I jolted awake for real. I said a prayer and went back to sleep. The encounter that followed was even worse. Yet again, I could hear things in my sleep. I was terrified and couldn't move any part of my body. I began to pray in my head as loud as I could, only to wake and feel my body slam on the bed as if I had been levitating. I called my grandma the next day, and she said that it was a demonic attack. I got my car shortly after a few days later, and never stayed in that hotel again. When I was 13 or 14, I was staying in a hostel in Ireland. This hostel was directly next to, supposedly, one of the most haunted places in Ireland, an abandoned mansion. In fact, the hostel was built from the bricks of the mansion. There was a story that a widow cursed someone in there, and when they died, they remained. After hearing this, being a young and dumb kid, 
I decided to taunt the ghost. Big mistake. Nothing happened after I taunted the ghost until I went to bed. That night, in the very right side of my bed, I heard light breathing. I paid it no mind because I've had experiences before and breathing was not a huge alarm for me. I eventually fell asleep and then I got a phone call on my phone at 3 to 5 a.m. Likely family from back home in the U.S. I didn't answer the call and I tried to go back to sleep, but there was a problem. My comforter had fallen off the bed to the right side of the bed and the breathing was loud and raspy now. At this point I was frightened because I had never heard breathing that loudly before and it just wouldn't stop. Needless to say, I didn't get my comforter out of fear and it was a good thing that I didn't. In the morning I was shocked by what I saw. To the right of my bed was the comforter laying on the ground and it looked as if there was a human underneath it. I could make out the arms, legs, and head. To this day, I genuinely believe that if I had reached for my comforter, something would have reached back. Not very far from my home, there is an abandoned place, which is my hideout. I honestly don't know what was in the place before it became abandoned. The place is a rather small, probably like 40 by 20 meter fenced off overgrown field with just one building. I can't tell what the building is either. It's a really small house-like place with no windows and one locked door. The field itself has a small, short sidewalk that has been taken over by nature. There's also a small hill in the field. You can tell that the place hasn't been visited for a really long time because the grass in there is quite overgrown and the house, fence, and path all have plants growing all over the place. Since it's currently spring, a lot of the foliage is growing and blooming and there were some wildflowers in the area as well. Today I took some scissors and went to the area with the intent of picking some flowers to make a cute bouquet to put in my home. As soon as I entered the area, something felt off and I suddenly became paranoid. I ignored the feeling since I have mental illness which causes me to have random paranoia at times. Keep in mind though that it doesn't cause hallucinations. It was still unusual for me to feel paranoid there because I would usually go there to relax and be calm. It's basically my safe spot. I went on to look around and pick some flowers, but then I heard some footstep-like noises behind me everywhere that I went. I brushed it off again, assuming that it could have been an insect or a small animal like a hedgehog or a rabbit. I felt like I was being watched the entire time, but again, I assumed that it was just my random paranoia. The thing that scared me the most happened when I was about to cut a big, white, pretty flower the only one of its kind in the whole area. As I was kneeling down to cut it, I suddenly felt a human presence behind me. This caused me to jump up, drop my bouquet out of shock, and yell out, whoa, and turn around. To my surprise, nothing was there. I was very confused since the presence felt awfully real. I picked up my bouquet and went home. I recently went bush camping with my boyfriend on Crown Land near Stone Mills, Ontario. It was our first time doing bush camping, so I sent a video of our campsite set up to a friend. Days after this happened, I talked to my friend, who asked me about the ghost in the video that I was completely unaware of since I didn't take a second look at it after sending. When I had that closer look, I zoomed in to see a terrifying skeleton-like figure. At first, I thought it was a glare on the lens from the fire, but the figure is moving way quicker than the speed of the camera. This place was very deserted, but throughout the night, I heard clear footsteps that sounded human. 
So much so that I thought that the cops had come to kick us out when I saw a flashlight point at us from the woods. I quickly pointed my light back, but never saw any animals or people. I have been camping a lot and have had deer, squirrels, and raccoons come to my campsite and their footsteps did not sound like the ones that I had heard. I'm not a believer of the paranormal or anything of the sort, so I didn't even think about it until watching the actual footage. Among the many ghost stories told during lull periods of lengthy military exercises, the one that stood out the most in Singapore is probably that of the Third Door Charlie Company. In short, it was about how a third door was made to allow the spirit of a recruit who had died a gruesome and mysterious death to leave peacefully. There was even a local movie made about the incident called 2359 that you can find on YouTube. I have personally seen this third door, so there's at least some credence to the story. My story, however, happened many years later when the camp was largely unused. My company was planning to use the rifle range near the camp for our annual rifle proficiency test, which lasted several days. I was selected to be part of a very small advance party that would arrive a few days before the main body. The barracks of the camp were essentially longhouses separated by their respective toilets and laundry areas. My platoon mates and I would occupy one of the longhouses during the night where we would play cards and tell creepy stories to pass time. It was almost midnight and I needed to relieve myself. I had just stepped out of the barrack when I noticed that the lights of the toilet belonging to the Charlie Company had suddenly come on. The bright white light cast a clear shadow of a man onto the water point of the laundry area. I froze. There was a voice telling me to investigate, while another told me to go and grab my friends. The shadow didn't seem to budge at all during the entire time that I was observing it. Then I heard my friend calling out for me. This snapped me out of my reverie as I rushed back in and pulled my friends out to show them what I had seen. By then, however, the lights had already gone back off. My friends suggested that it was probably the range warden, which was the only logical explanation. What really puzzled me then was that my friend had called out to me because I had been gone for too long, but yet, in my mind, the whole thing only lasted for a minute or two. The next day, I quizzed the range warden about the incident, and a worried look came over his face as he explained that he was nowhere near the camp the night before. What's more perplexing was that the power to Charlie Company had been cut. I grew up in the country in North Carolina. I lived up in the woods where there used to be a water mill. A family lived there back in the 40s. The parents had two daughters and one son. Unfortunately, one of the daughters got caught under the water wheel and drowned. Ever since I was a kid, I always heard humming and low singing in the woods when I was out tromping around. But one thing that really scared me one night is when I was older. I worked for the sheriff's office and I had left work early one night due to being over on my hours. I got home around 2.30ish, and when I pulled up, I saw the figure of a little girl standing right beside my garage. When I got out of my car, she was gone. The next experience I had was when I was out hunting in the same woods. It was super quiet, a beautiful fall evening. I had just gotten down into my stand when all of a sudden I started hearing the same humming and singing I had heard multiple times over the years but then I heard what sounded like someone walking toward me. I looked around everywhere and couldn't see anything. Then I heard a laugh, but not the same laugh as before. So as I was climbing down my tree stand, a rock hit my boot. And once again, I heard the laughing. Now mind you, the area where I was hunting was about three miles deep in the woods, and there was no one around. 
I brought my brother and cousin and a few friends down there one night, and we were going to just sit and listen and see if we could hear anything. We were down there playing cards, joking around, when all of us heard what sounded like someone in distress. We all got quiet and listened, and we could hear what sounded like someone breathing heavily. And the thing that confuses me about that night was if it was the little girl or something more dark. Sometimes I think things are better left alone. I live in a small town, and things like rumors tend to spread pretty quickly since folks around here are incredibly nosy beings. The most trusted source of these rumors is the local bar located in the center of the small settlement that we live in, which my father visits frequently. It is right by the school that I go to. Anyway, two weeks before all this bullcrap started, he came back with quite the story. It is said that something off has been going on with our town's graveyard, which is right by these creepy old woods a little bit away from the town itself. Usually takes 20 minutes to get there by car. Apparently, drunkards there claim that there's a medium disguised as a homeless man hanging around the woods surrounding the graveyard, and that sometimes he can even be found by the graves eating bread. At first, I didn't believe it, so me and my friend decided to walk to the graveyard and hang around there trying to find that guy. So we did, and the graveyard was full of people for a few hours, but the normal kind of people. A few more hours passed, and soon there was no one left except for an old, bearded man on the bench by the football field across the woods in the parking lot. He was looking at empty plastic bags with a box of cigarettes resting beside him. Nothing suspicious. My friend had the guts to walk up to him and insult him. I walked away from her, but when she crossed the line, I pulled her away, telling her that he may be a serial killer or a crazy drug addict. But he remained quiet until she yanked her hand away from mine, grabbed his box of cigarettes, and crushed it under her feet. She also threatened to hurt him if he didn't speak. And that's when he stood up and looked her dead in the eyes, and he was much taller than her too. He told her something along the lines of, you are a disgrace in the eyes of God, and walked away onto the road until we lost track of him. I started to worry, and told her that maybe he was a priest or a monk, and now was going to tell everyone in our town how she had mocked him, and I was actually afraid. She reassured me that he was none of these things, because he had cigarettes with him, but I think those weren't even his. That night I slept over at her house because I was scared to go back to mine alone. I woke up in the middle of the night, and since I was sleeping in the same bed with her, I had a clear view of the pitch black shadow of a man standing over her right beside her bed, his palm on her wrist. I raised my body, getting ready to stand up, but he turned his head to me and started to shake it from left to right. So I figured it was a lucid dream and rolled over to the other side, drifting back to sleep. The next morning, she looked pale and ghostly, and I asked her if she got enough rest. She informed me that she did not even sleep, and kept having problems with her breathing and her heartbeat. I was so scared that I almost pissed myself right there and then, and as of now, I am home alone and feeling like I am being watched. I went camping on a hiking trail in the Shawnee State Forest. During the day, I set up camp and went fishing in a creek running along next to the campsites. Most of the day, I felt fine and peaceful. I tend to feel at home in the woods alone and fly fishing. I started a fire, started on dinner over the fire before it got dark, and stoked the fire. Once it got dark, I felt compelled to keep the fire stoked, and a feeling of panic would set in if it even began to die down. I couldn't relax. I was constantly looking over my shoulder. It got to the point where I just grabbed my light and walked out, leaving all of my stuff there. I got out to the parking lot about a mile and a half away and tried to steal my nerves and go back. 
but couldn't step past the tree line. I waited all the way until morning to go back to get my stuff, and the feeling was gone. I got everything together and left. Haven't been back since. I don't know if it was a ghost or a native spirit since this place is deep in what used to be Shawnee tribe land. This is a true story. When I was in high school, I had a friend who lived near our house. We would always walk from school to our homes. We were pretty close, and we talked about anything. One time, when we were walking along the road, she suddenly spoke and said that she smelled candles. It was a busy street, and it was only around 4 p.m., I think. I replied, it must be from the truck. I said this because one had just driven past us when she said that. She had a serious face, which was unusual because she was more talkative between the two of us. She insisted that she could still smell it as we continued walking, but stopped after a while. Fast forward to the next day. It was Saturday and I had just woken up. I literally got goosebumps. I felt so shocked when I read her text. It said that her father had died. Do you also believe in superstitions? Here in our country, a smell of flower or candle indicates the death of a person. My family lives near a very large conference center in Northeast Georgia. Due to COVID-19, the conference center has been shuttered and abandoned since May. This is a sprawling property with over 900 acres of forest, lake, and wilderness with a few large hotels and a dining room, auditorium, etc. It's been around for about 50 to 60 years, although my family has only been in the area since the 90s. My girlfriend and I decided to explore the property, since it's been abandoned for months now. The entrance is very securely gated. There's no way to get past the front gates without a bulldozer, so we walked through the woods, leaving the car at the top. We walked through the parking lots to make sure that no one else was there. The location is very remote, so it would be extremely unlikely that anyone would visit on foot, especially in the middle of the night on Thanksgiving. We got access through an upper exterior door, and we started poking around the main hotel. It was completely abandoned, but left in good condition. It was spooky, as the only lighting came from the red glow of the emergency exit signs. We looked in many of the other rooms, and everything seemed neat and orderly, like guests could check in at any moment. We reached the main lobby, and then we both heard it, and froze. We simultaneously heard what sounded like a music box playing deep within one of the halls. Neither of us believe in the paranormal, but we both froze dead in our tracks and looked at each other, our faces confirming that we were both terrified. We bolted as fast as we could through the upper door, making sure that it closed securely behind us and fled on foot. The music 100% sounded like it was coming from a music box, but it was also vaguely metallic. Almost like it was a different frequency than most music. Due to the way that it sounded, we ruled out that it could be a forgotten cell phone or a computer. This was not any type of alert or notification made by an electronic device. There's also no cell phone service out there. Usually, I can find a logical explanation for paranormal phenomena as I'm admittedly skeptical about it. However, I cannot figure out for the life of me what that music could have been. There was no one else on the property. There were absolutely no signs of squatters, and there's no music boxes in the hotel rooms. They are all intentionally identical, so there would have been one in every room. Does anyone have any insight on this? We were genuinely terrified, but now I'm regretting not investigating further.
I was 14 at the time this happened. I had just moved downstairs because I wanted more privacy, as my parents were always checking in on me. I've always been a rebellious kid and wanted to be alone and do my own thing, without anyone telling me not to. I had always noticed strange things happening around my house, and I kept asking my parents if they were going through my stuff in my room. They would always say no, so I always brushed it off. These things still happen to me to this day, like things being moved and waking up in a cold sweat, with no explanation. One night I was on my phone and I felt this feeling of dread and anxiety come over me. I then heard a voice say, it's okay, and I looked up and a black silhouette of a woman was standing at the foot of my bed. She had no face, but I could clearly see the outline of a petite woman just standing there. I remember feeling very scared, but also very calm at the same time. I was looking at her for 15 seconds before she vanished. I told my parents what had happened, and they were also scared because my dad would always say that he felt a presence in the house. I instantly moved back up to the main floor. I remember telling people about it, and I would always remind them that my parents built the house, so there were no previous owners. People have given the idea that it was my grandma who passed away a year before this happened. I still question if this is true. I've not had anything that intense happen to me again. I still have the nightmares and also question what she meant. Why was it okay? I remember telling that to myself over and over. I'm thinking of moving back down soon, but for now, I think I'm good. I'm in the Navy and I currently work on a base which encompasses an island called San Clemente Island. The island itself is mostly deserted and is untouched. But on the north side of the island is a town, for lack of better words, where the Navy and contractors live. One night I was headed down to relieve a co-worker from watch. As I'm driving down the road, which is mostly pitch black, I see a figure in the street in my headlights. Naturally, I slam the brakes. I begin cussing up a storm because some idiot is walking in the middle of the road at night. Shortly after, however, I notice that it isn't a person, but more of a solid shadow. You could make out no features on it, but it had mass and was human-shaped. It was in the middle of the road and sort of stomping, almost like a weird dance. Then suddenly, it was just gone. It didn't fade away, didn't do anything dramatic, just disappeared. I freaked out and told a lot of my coworkers who didn't believe me. We never saw it again. I have heard some stories of people on the island having doors in their work areas open and stuff moving around on its own, but no stories anything similar to mine. I don't know much about the history of the island itself, but I do know at some point it was owned by Native Americans and quite often remains of them are found or unearthed. I'm an actor at a haunted attraction in Pennsylvania. I was playing Jason on the hayride scene tonight. I hop up on the hayride and walk up and down the middle of it and scare people. This is my second year doing it and I absolutely love this gig. But tonight, something happened that I couldn't explain. It was the second to last wagon of the evening. I was in the middle of the wagon, headed toward the front, when I got a really bad gut feeling that something was off. I got chills immediately and tried to hide the feeling of terror I had at that moment from customers. I turned my head, and to my left I saw a girl staring at me. She looked completely normal at first, until she blinked. In what seemed like hours, I saw her blink in slow motion, her eyes going from the sides and meeting at the middle. After the first blink, I saw her eyes turn completely black. She cracked a small smile while staring at me straight through my mask and into my soul. 
I heard her laugh inside my head. I was frozen for a moment, and she blinked again, and she looked normal. My body unfroze, and I tried my best to finish the wagon. This was literally the scariest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. What did I see? I was wondering if anyone could offer their thoughts or an explanation on a paranormal experience that I had as a child. When I was 11, my younger sister passed away from a very sudden death. Months before this incident, I had a vision in the middle of the night that I had never made sense of until recently. I had woken up and saw a floating orb of white light in my room. Inside of it was a young child, around four, maybe five years old, the same age as my late sister, with short hair wearing a Victorian-style nightgown. I came close to it and stared at it for a minute or two, and then went back to sleep. The next day, I was filled with overwhelming anxiety and the feeling of someone's presence in the house. Only years after this vision and the death of my sister have I thought that this could possibly be some sort of omen or warning of her death. I spent the weekend camping throughout the Northeast, and all was very normal and quite nice. However, last night I camped in Massachusetts in a wooded area between Providence and Plymouth. Nothing felt negative, but I saw lights at least three times. The last time was just minutes ago, and that's what prompted me to write this. The lights are very quick, and almost out of the corner of my eye. I don't know what to say or quite how to describe it. I've never seen anything like it. And if it was paranormal, and if it was paranormal, it was very clear. However, each time they disappeared the second that I looked directly at them.